Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. Our monthly leaders forum addresses vital issues facing society, the economy, real estate, medicine, technology, and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Plow. I'm the executive director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a 501c3 National American Charitable Organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv, the leading institution named in honor of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The hospital is a motto of coexistence as it serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center via our website and social media outlets on Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube, and on our Facebook page and discussion group. Today's Global Connections topic is Becoming a Better Person. Thank you to our very special guest, David Brooks, columnist of the New York Times and author of the book, How to Know a Person. Robert J. Waldinger, professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School and Rabbi David Wolpe, visiting scholar at the Harvard Divinity School. And now, Global Connections with Robert Siegel. Thank you, Josh. Uh, the idea for this panel uh, came to me while I was listening to David Brooks talk about his latest book, How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. When he's not writing his column for the New York Times, uh, David Brooks, for several years now, has been exploring questions about uh, what it means to be a feeling, caring, social being, uh, and what contemporary psychology, sociology, neuroscience uh, have to tell us about that challenge. How can we make life better, happier, uh, more meaningful? It's not a typical question for global connections, and I assure you that next month uh, we'll, we'll have a panel about uh, war and peace in the Middle East, uh, back to ideas that are unfortunately, distressingly normal. Uh, but for this month, we've brought together three people who've spent many years uh, thinking hard and working about the question of what constitutes living well uh, as a matter of happiness, health, faith, uh, service to others. Uh, I have many questions for our panelists, and we begin with David Brooks. Uh, his previous books uh, include The Second Mountain, The Road to Character, The Social Animal, and Bobos in Paradise. Uh, in his column and in his weekly appearances on the PBS NewsHour, he is also an astute political observer, especially when the matter being observed is American contemporary conservatism and the Republican Party. I'll let the record show that before the Times column and the PBS gig, he also appeared weekly on NPR's All Things Considered for many years. Uh, David Brooks, it's good to see you once again. Always good to be back with you. It brings back many years together. Here, here. Uh, in in, uh, in uh, the book, you mentioned uh, your book, uh, uh, Bobos in Paradise. Bobos was your coinage for Bohemia, bourgeois Bohemians who were uh, materialistic, uh, capitalistic, self-styled idealists, uh, how they lived and how they shopped, uh, essentially. You said that you, you, you still are proud of the work, but you're, you're after bigger game right now. I want you to describe the mission in your writing. Yeah, my, um, that book, uh, I started my career as a smart aleck. <laughs> and so I would go to Restoration Hardware and watch people and then make fun of them. Uh, and so that was a book about making fun of people who had sub-zero sub refrigerators because zero just wouldn't be cold enough. Uh, but what I was doing in those, what I called comic sociology, my first two books, I was- I, I think you called it investigative sociology, actually. I tried to make it comic. You might have thought <laughs> it was investigative. I thought it was funny. Uh, but uh I uh, tried to make generalizations about people and about where the culture was. And, and that's, I'm proud of that work. It, it was good. But uh, I think I've tried to move on to I've, I've become more suspicious as our country has gone downhill sociologically and psychologically, uh, suspicious of generalizations about types. Uh, and uh, there are so many people who feel um, alone and invisible uh, and so many people who uh, 
you know, who say they have no close personal friends, who are not in a romantic relationship, who are contemplating suicide and depression. And it just seems to me there's an epidemic of blindness uh, in our society. These people feel unseen. So I'm sort of stepping back from making generalizations about groups of people and trying to figure out how to see each individual one at a time, which seems to me the great psychic need of our culture at the moment. You write about uh, people who, who can act as illuminators, or, or perhaps we all can act as illuminators. I want you to describe what, that, what you mean by that. Yeah, I allow myself a dualism about every third book. And in this book, <laughs> I have uh, a dualism between uh, diminishers and illuminators. And diminishers are people who make you feel unseen. Uh, they're not curious about you. They don't ask you a question. Sometimes I go to a party and at the end, I think, you know, that whole time, nobody asked me a question. And I've come to believe that uh, all sorts of people, maybe only about 30% of humanity are question askers. The rest are perfectly nice people. They're just not curious about you. Uh, and diminishers stereotype, they do a thing called stacking. Uh, stacking is I learn one fact about you, then I make a whole series of assumptions about who you must be. Uh, you voted for Donald Trump, therefore you must be X, Y, and Z. And stacking is almost always inaccurate. On the other hand, illuminators are people who are curious about you. They make you feel lit up, seen, uh, and they begin a little to see the world from your point of view. They have that emp empathetic skill. And so one of the examples I use in the book is Ian e. Foster, who was a novelist about 120 years ago. And his biographer wrote of him that to be to, to be with him was to be, quote, seduced by an inverse charisma, a sense of being listened to with such intensity, you had to be your sharpest, most honest and best self. And I'd love to be able to listen with that intensity. Another story I tell, which is possibly apocryphal, but it gets the point across, mm -hmm. concerns a young woman named Jenny Jerome, who would later become Winston Churchill's mom. But when she was a young woman, she was in Victorian England, uh, and she was seated one night at a dinner next to William Gladstone, the prime minister. And she left that dinner thinking that Gladstone was the cleverest person in England. And then sometime later, she's at a, another dinner, the story goes, and she happens to be seated next to Benjamin Disraeli, which is Gladstone's great political rival. Uh, and she leaves that dinner thinking that she's the cleverest person in England. <laughs> and so it's nice to be Gladstone. It's better to be Disraeli. We want to make people feel lit up, special, clever. Your book is, it is literally a how-to book, at least by the title, how to uh, do something. Uh, and, and this suggests something which I realize uh, cuts against an assumption I've had for many years. My assumption having been that uh, some people are... Uh, uh, highly empathic. Uh, some people are terrible narcissists. They only care about them about themselves. Uh, you're not only suggesting a great uh, continuum, which I would, I, is not so 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 novel, but that um, these are skills. I mean, we 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 could study how to be illuminators and uh, and 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 follow your guidance in that case. Do you, do you think we're that malleable in adult life? Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, compare it to like athletic ability. Some people are born with more coordination than others, but nobody gets good without practice. Uh, and we can all improve with practice. Uh, and so to me, the one of the things lacking in American society is just we're not good at certain skills. Uh, how do you listen well? How do you ask for an offer of forgiveness? How do you break up with someone without crushing their heart? How do you sit with someone who's suffering from depression? How do you host a dinner party so everybody feels included? These are skills the way carpentry is a skill and the way learning tennis is a skill. And so, for example, you know, I, I consulted with conversation experts. How do you become a better conversationalist? And they gave me a bunch of tips, uh, which uh, I think are just tips and they, they make you better at it. So one of them is make them authors, not witnesses. People don't go into enough detail when they're telling you a story. And so if you say, uh, well, where was your boss sitting when she said that? Suddenly they're in narrative mode and they're much more interesting. Uh, I've learned always to try to get people in the storytelling mode. So as a journalist, I no longer ask people, what do you believe? I ask people, how did you come to believe that? Mm -hmm. And suddenly they're telling me a story about an experience in their life or a person who influenced their life. You're just learning a lot more about them. The final one I'll mention, which seems to resonate with people, is don't be a topper. And so, for example, if you say to me, I just had a terrible flight, we were on the tarmac for two hours. And then I say to you, oh, I know exactly we're going through. I had a terrible flight. We were on the tarmac for six hours. And it sounds like I'm trying to relate to you. But what I'm really doing is let's stop talking about your insignificant experiences and let's talk more about my significant experiences. Uh, and so don't be a topper. And so these are just basic practical tips. 
And I, I've made the book more practical than anything else I've ever written, just because I think me and many other people in America are just lacking these skills and we could all get a little better. I just want to ask you one more thing before uh, before we go on to our next panelist. But uh, this your your notion of the illuminator is juxtaposed against in in the book a um, an, an older heroic warrior statesman model of of how one was supposed to relate to other people. Uh, and um, are, are we? Uh, are, are, is this a societal change that we've decided to? Uh, uh, to change what we admire, uh, or um, uh, is the heroic statesman warrior just an, uh, you know uh, still someone we need, but uh, we'll, we'll, he'll get there through different means? Yeah, I, I mean, I like heroic statesman warriors. I'm a fan. My favorite movie is called The Searchers, in which John Wayne is a heroic statesman warrior who is too <laughs> raw and savage to live in the domestic society he actually creates. But, you know, I've become influenced over the last few years by a philosopher named Iris Murdoch. And through the centuries, male moral philosophers created these abstract systems that were intellectually impregnable. But a lot of these philosophers, when you go back and read about them, they were uh, bachelors, they were childless, and they were lonely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they, they were not great at understanding the systems of care that women were building around. Right. And Iris Murdoch focuses on those, the minute, she says, morality is something that happens every day and how we treat each other in the complex circumstances of life. And usually we see the world through an egotistical lens, but our job is, she says, is to cast a just and loving attention on others. And she writes, we can grow by looking. And so it's that minute attention, attention being a moral act that she emphasizes is the way to become a better person to get to our subject. Well, David Brooks, hang around because uh, in about 15, 20 minutes, we'll have our discussion period and I want to hear from you again. But uh, for now, thank you. And we're going to turn to our next panelist, Dr. Robert Waldinger, uh, who is a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, Zen priest, a Harvard professor, and the fourth director of the Harvard Study of Adult Development. Uh, to explain that, since 1938, uh, that study has been following hundreds of men, uh, interviewing them, giving them medical examinations and tests. It, it started with uh, 268 Harvard undergraduates, uh, and it has expanded uh, to include young men from, they were then young men, uh, from uh, Boston's poorest neighborhoods where delinquency ran high, but where they were uh, seemingly uh, Im immune to that. Uh, over the years, uh, as the uh, families of these subjects of the experiment have grown uh, women have been become part of the uh, of the uh, of, of the experiment as well dr waldinger bob waldinger thank you very much for doing this oh it's a pleasure to be here and i should say that you and your colleague mark schultz uh, wrote a book about uh, what you've gleaned from this enormous uh, not not mountain of data this mountain chain of data uh, that's been uh, uh, mined here and you can remarkably, uh, your book it was it's called The Good Life, and I was struck by how uh, for the phenomenal quantity of the data, you were able to come to a pretty simple uh, main inference of what makes us what makes us happier and feel better in life. And it's our relationships with other people. Yes, it was an inference that at first we didn't believe in our own data as we began to see that the people who lived longer, who stayed healthier and were happier, were the people who were more connected to others. And that the strongest predictor of who was gonna age well and live long turned out to be how happy you were in your connections with other people. You, you started out with a combination of, of uh, Harvard undergraduates and uh, people who were avoiding becoming juvenile delinquencies in, in uh, some very poor neighborhoods in, in Boston. Uh, how much happier were the clearly uh, better educated and uh, possibly uh, from families that were much better off than, these, than the other group? The Harvard group was not on average happier than the inner city group, than these young men who were born into such disadvantaged circumstances. Um, that the Harvard men lived longer because of their access to health care, because of their education about the importance of taking care of your health, but they were no happier. Looking at this from the negative side, uh, what you find is uh, loneliness kills. Uh, uh, loneliness has the equivalent, you found, of uh, smoking a half a pack of cigarettes a day. And having untreated hypertension mm -hmm. and being obese 
all of those things. Um, and now we've begun to unpack in our laboratory exactly how that works. So how do relationships get into our body in a protective way? How does loneliness get into the body and break down body systems? And that's been a, a really vibrant source of investigation over the last 20 years now. I I, I assume that uh, one agent uh, between loneliness and uh, lack of longevity uh, is is the self medication that takes place among the lonely. That is, uh, alcohol plays a role here. Alcohol does play a role, but the primary driver seems to be stress, and stress, as we know, also drives alcohol consumption. But what we know is that we evolved as as creatures to be social animals because it's safer to be in groups. We survive better if we're in groups. And so it turns out that being lonely, being isolated physically, makes us sleep less soundly, among other things. And it increases all the stress hormones that circulate through the body and break down coronary arteries and joints and the pancreas, all of those things. When when you speak of relationships, we're talking primarily about uh, family, uh, close friends, uh, but not, you would include just, yeah. lots of any, all sorts of interactions with people. Yes. It turns out that, um, casual relationships, uh, don't get enough credit that talking to the person who makes your coffee for you in the coffee shop in the morning, having a good exchange with your Uber driver, that those things literally give us hits of well-being that are measurable and that turn out to add to our sense of belonging and add to our positive physiologic balance. Yeah, you, you, you cite a study that was conducted in, in Chicago uh, with the commuters on a, on, on a commuter train, which, which I, I want you to relate. It's a fascinating yes. study. Yes. So it's a, it's a good example of how we're bad at predicting what's going to make us happy. <laughs> a group of investigators um, took commuters who were about to get on one of the many commuter trains in Chicago, and they randomly chose some to assign to do what they normally did, look at their phones, read the newspaper, listen to music, and the others were assigned to talk to a stranger. And they asked everybody before they completed their assignment, how much do you think you're going to enjoy this? And the people who were assigned to talk to strangers did not think they were going to like it. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, after they'd completed their assignments, the people who had been assigned to talk to strangers were significantly happier getting off those trains than the people who had done what they normally did on their commutes. This, of course, was back in the days when people uh, probably weren't wired in the uh, uh, in the train no. because you could actually speak with somebody else. Well, but it was it was during the days when people were wired. So it 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 often you would talk to someone and they would take out their headphones and talk to you. Really? Uh, we, so it was when we were all very much glued to our screens. Um. <laughs> It's, it's a fascinating observation. How is it that uh, the the basis of happiness, the causes of happiness can leap out at you from uh, decades of research? And yet uh, there seem to be so many incentives in opposite directions in society that we've 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 created lives for ourselves, which uh, uh, pr preclude very often the very activities that would make life happier. Well, one of the issues is that relationships are really hidden in plain sight. I mean, we've never been in the world without relationships, so we take them entirely for granted, many of mm -hmm. us. Um, in addition, what we know is that media uh, make money by capturing and holding our attention, right? You know, David Brooks just talked about attention. Giving each other our undivided attention is now harder than ever because the world is competing to take our attention away from each other. And so it's, it is becoming increasingly more difficult. The path of least resistance is social isolation. I'm, I'm curious when, uh, when you look over 
all of this data starting in the 1930s. Uh, do, do you find that the, um, the, the people who are being described in the 1930s and 40s uh, are, are, are they similar or, or are they markedly different from say their, their children who become part of the study ultimately as well? That is, uh, are we the same people or have our values as a population changed dramatically over time? We are so much the same people. And in fact, the things that we want, the things that we try to achieve for ourselves and our families are so similar across the generations that we've studied. And in fact, one of my colleagues just published a set of studies asking the question, are we as people less moral than we used to be? And mm -hmm. it turns out when you analyze data over 75 years, we are no less kind to each other day to day than we were in the past. That these are myths, myths that we tell each other, that we tell ourselves about the decline of human connection and the value of human connection. We do very often remark on how polarized we are as a people, not just, and, and, and when we say that politically, it implies lots of cultural uh, polarization as well. Does something like that show through or are you more struck by what's consistent uh, uh, between people and from different experiences? What's consistent is the local power of connection, that we are polarized from each other in tribes, right? And we're polarized from each other when we look at what media tell us about the world. But day to day, when you ask people, have you been treated with kindness in the last 24 hours in your neighborhood, at your workplace? We say yes, just as often as ever before. The majority of people will say yes, so that locally, microscopically, we're good to each other more often than not. Uh, Bob Waldinger, stay with us, because in a few minutes we'll be back for the, the discussion period. But uh, first, we're going to turn to our third panelist, uh, David Wolpe. Uh, Rabbi David Wolpe is one of the most influential rabbis in the United States. Uh, for 26 years, he was the senior rabbi at Sinai Temple, big uh, conservative congregation in Los Angeles. Uh, this year, he is visiting scholar at Harvard Divinity School. Uh, Rabbi Wolpe has written and spoken widely about Judaism. Uh, he's the author of many books, including David, the Divided Heart, about King David. Rabbi uh, Wolpe, thanks for joining us. Today. Thank you. I'm curious to hear what you make of what we've heard from, from David Brooks and, and from Bob Waldinger. Uh, uh, are these are these familiar uh, observations to a, a rabbi who uh, had a great many conversations with a great many people? So first of all, I would like to say that I was listening. Um, <laughs> and that's the first thing. Uh, I actually, what they both remind me of is how important it is, you should forgive me, to have houses of worship. Because if you want to talk about communities that endure, and people who care about each other and see each other and gather together to do things like sing together and to bring each other food and to do all that which community ought to do, I think houses of worship are incredibly important and given in this. So yes, I mean, I see the same isolation and, uh, and that's at least one of the contributors to, uh, to human connection. Oh yes, you told me when we spoke earlier the joyous practices lead to joy. It's not just that joy leads to joyous practices. Well, right. One of the, one of the insights of uh, traditional religions is that sometimes it's called the James Lang effect in psychology. Your emotion follows your actions. So if someone is depressed and you say, go out and dance and they go, I don't want to dance because they're in a way enjoying or sunk in their depression. And they know if they dance, it will change their mood. And this is incredibly useful as a tool it's almost like if you talk to the stranger next to you, it's hard, I don't want to, I kind of enjoy my isolation. But then if you do it, it reminds me, my daughter used to joke that I would, on a Saturday night, I would say, I don't want to have to put a tuxedo on and go out and do a wedding. And she said, and then dad, every time you came home and I said, how was it? You went, it was great. Mm -hmm. um, it's sometimes you have to force yourself and then uh, you're led along by the joy and the, um, and the emotion and presence of others. What, what do you think about the notion that um, we are malleable? We could read a how-to book on how to converse with people and change, become 
uh, you know, more more empathic people than we were before. Uh, did you did you find your congregants changing a great deal throughout adult life? Um, it varies, and it depends in part a lot. It depends in part on circumstance, um, and also, I think that a lot of this is what um, Dr. Waldinger talked about, which is we don't believe anymore that we can get better. Everybody says, oh, social media makes you mean, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to, and you don't need to. And I, I remember when, when we spoke before, I told you that Rabbi Nachman said this beautiful thing. He said, if you believe you can break, then believe you can heal. And I think a lot of people believe they can break, but they don't actually believe they can heal. And, and anybody who's watched human beings in all sorts of situations, including in extremists, knows that you have unexpected reconciliations, um, unplanned for acts of goodness and of grace, and uh, unplanned kindnesses that can arise. You know, um, I, it's like the John Macefield poem. You know, I've seen, I've seen flowers grow in stony places. I assume that uh, as a, certainly as, as a congregational rabbi, that you had a great many conversations uh, with people who needed a serious conversation uh, with yeah. you about uh, changes in, in life, uh, imminence of death in the family, whatever. I mean, did you come by any wisdom about uh, how to approach those conversations, what to say or what not to say? So the wisdom primarily that I uh, would come away with is that it's incredibly important, first of all, to listen to the person and not just wait, you know, not just prepare your answer, but actually there's a, a technique in, in the Hasidic tradition um, of called bitul hayesh, nullification of the self. Like you first have to be able to take the other person in and what their situation is. And then I think we ought to make a distinction in this whole conversation between being good and being happy. Mm -hmm. They often coincide, but they don't always coincide. And sometimes meaning doesn't make you happy, but it makes you meaningful. There's something deeper than being happy. Um, and so sometimes you had to encourage people to do what was right, even though it would be at least superficially at the expense of their own happiness. So I think it's interesting the conversation was framed being a good person and not just being a happy person. Um, because happiness doesn't always make you good and goodness doesn't always make you happy. There's a great overlap, but in the end, I think if you choose goodness, you will be more satisfied with your life. You, you, you quoted uh, uh, to me a line from the philosopher William James. Yes. I think I have this right. The, the greatest use of a life is to spend it on something that will outlast it. Yep. And I, I thought about that a good deal. And it, it did occur to me that... Um, Things that outlast the time of our lives include, of course, they include family and uh, they include philanthropy, but they include the sportswear company we started or the hedge fund that we began. It, it, it's, it includes lots of things. Right. Uh, uh, it, 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 it must be more than just something that, that puts our name on the wall someplace after we're, after we're I think for James, I mean, he was talking about something that outlasts it, that's meaningful and important and that you can be proud of. Although for some people, creating something that is a business that takes care of people can be enormously meaningful and enduring. Um, and so it depends what you feel your mission and your purpose is in life. I mean, when I, I always think that the, the purpose of life is to grow our souls, but there are a million ways to do that. Um, and, and I'll actually, I'll pair the James brothers. Um, for William said, the great use of life is to spend it on something that outlasts it. And, and his nephew reports Henry James as saying the three most important things in life are to be kind, to be kind, and to be kind. <laughs> and I think when you put those two together, you have a pretty good program for a good life. I was curious to hear what you made of, uh, I think, two conflicting appraisals from from uh, from David and 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 from Bob Waldinger. Uh, David says, in these days when we are we've crashed socially and psychologically, and we're we're in a state of uh, of uh, psychological disaster. I, I don't have his his exact words handy. 
um, that's where we are today. Bob Wallinger spoke of how similar actually our moral condition is uh, to what it was when people were being asked in 1938 what uh, what they made of life. And I, I wonder where you where you fall on the spectrum of um, uh, life is going to hell in a handbasket or, uh, you know, things are pretty much the same as they've always been. Well, it's probably better professionally for me to think life, you know, is going to hell in a handbasket. Um, but I would say I, I actually think it depends what arena you're talking about. Mm -hmm. COVID made us lonelier. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mm -hmm. see it. Even my students say so. And social media often made us meaner. But in day to day interactions on the street, in interpersonal interactions, I think it's so important to see other people's faces. You know, the face of, of, of the other is just changes who you are and how you react. So I would say the screen human beings are, are meaner and smaller than we really are, but the human beings in real life, um, we're still, that's where I think you're able to see the most important thing, which is the image of God in another person. Rabbi Wolpe, thank you very much. Stick with us right now, because I'd like to bring back David Brooks and uh, and also Bob Waldinger. And uh, first ask, uh, you've had a chance to comment on what you heard from uh, from the two panelists who preceded you. Uh, first, I'd like to hear from from David and Bob about what you've what you've heard from your fellow panelists. Uh, David, anything you'd, you'd like to remark on? Well, I'll go right to this question of whether we're a, a nation in social and emotional decline. Right. Uh, and so I, so I read the study about the kindness study. And of course, human nature is human nature is human nature. And so I, I'm, I'm suspicious of broad theories of moral decline. In some ways, we're a vastly more moral society than we were 50 years ago, especially to formerly marginalized groups. But I do think the weight of evidence about our social connection really is pretty striking. Um, the number of people who say they have no close personal friends since 2000 is up by four times. The number of people who say they have no romantic partner is up by a third. 54% uh, of Americans say that no one knows them well. And the big number to me is interpersonal trust. If you ask people a generation ago or two generations ago, can you trust your neighbors? You'd get somewhere between 50 and 60 people say, yeah, the people around me are trustworthy. And uh, now it's 30% and 19% of millennials. Uh, and so that strikes me that there is some level of, at least in our interpersonal skills and our interpersonal trustworthiness, there has been some decline. I just read a piece in The Atlantic today by Derek Thompson pointing out that several years ago, we spent a lot more time with friends than we did with pets. <laughs> now we spend a lot more time with pets than with friends, apparently, uh, which I did not know. But uh, And Jonathan Knight, <laughs> my final bit of data, has a, a, a book coming out in a couple months saying when we're on our screen... The key thing is we're not having an experience. It's a pseudo experience that leaves no mark. And so all the human learning we do through casual friendships or just hanging out with people, that learning is not happening. And so to me, I don't want to talk about moral decline, but I do think we treat each other in less trustworthy ways. Uh, Bob Waldinger, you include relations with our pets as uh, you know one, one source of happiness in life. Well, it certainly is, although I haven't studied that personally. And, and David... <laughs> You are absolutely right, David Brooks, about, about the sort of increasing social isolation, increasing loneliness. Those statistics are stark and dramatic. And that's different from moral decline, right? And, it, and it's different from a, a, a concern for kindness. Um, but uh, what we do find is that this epidemic of loneliness is increasing. It has been accelerated by social media, for sure. But I also want to throw something else in, which is that as much as I personally am skeptical of online interaction, I'm also a psychiatrist who does psychotherapy every day. If you had told me four years ago that meaningful, insight-oriented psychotherapy was possible on Zoom, I would have said you were out of your mind. Now, my colleagues and I are doing it, and we're finding that there is meaningful work being done. The question is, what gets filtered out in human interaction through a digital space? We know that things are filtered. We know that forms of emotional communication are filtered, but we don't know yet exactly what the filtration process is or what the consequences of that are. And I think we're going to find out in the coming years from research what the effects are. 
David Welty, it, did you? If it's an addition, great. If it is a substitution, we're in trouble. During COVID, it was a substitution. And I, I tape something every day to send to my congregation. And, and I think that it was, it helped us keep in touch and it was great, but only because I couldn't speak to them in person. Uh, but I, what I fear is not just that, that it's often a substitution because it's just easier, but also that social media, especially for younger people, substitutes fantasy lives for real lives in the sense that when I used to watch TV as a kid, I knew that all those things I was seeing were essentially fantasy. But when you see people on Instagram living lives that you could never aspire to and looking in ways that you could never aspire to, I'm not sure that kids anymore understand that's a fantasy and it should, in fact, I know they don't and shouldn't affect my conception of myself. So there is an element of unreality that gets turned into reality on a screen mm -hmm. that is extreme, I think, extremely damaging. Here's a, a, a comment or question from uh, Wendy Reed, who is, who is uh, watching us. With so many Americans kept riled up so much of the time by rhetoric and negative social media, uh, it seems hard to break through the brain barrier that enables people to access curiosity and empathy. What thoughts do you have on how to enable Americans to get calm enough or feel safe enough to mm -hmm. access these qualities? Uh, we'll start with David Brooks. Yeah, well, I'm in the political journalism business, so I I, I uh, face people who are filled with anger at people who work at the New York Times, say. Uh, and so I, I asked them about their childhood. Uh, and I, I'm, I was very moved. There's a guy named Dan McAdams at Northwestern who studies how people tell their life stories. And what he does, he brings them into his lab. And he asks them, tell me about the high points of your life, the, the low points of your life, the turning points of your life. And then after about four hours, he hands them a check to compensate them for their time. And a lot of the people just push back the check and say, I don't want to take money for this. This has been one of the best afternoons of my life. And what I've learned over the last few years is if you ask people to tell you their life story, they're thrilled. They get more pleasure out of that than making money. Uh, and and they will talk. If you ask them their life story, they will tell you their life story. And it's always more interesting than any stereotype you may have of them. Uh, and so I found just getting to asking people up their life story, and then you can talk about politics. Yeah. My other line is that if you're if you're going to Thanksgiving meal uh, and you're worried about you're going to have a fight, political fight with one of your relatives, start the conversation on the conversational topic. Things I've always resented about you. <laughs> and then when you get to politics, it'll seem OK. <laughs> uh, Bob Waldinger, uh, the, the word money just came up there for a moment, incidentally. And I, I, I thought I, I don't want to give short shrift to the significance of, of wealth. That is, you've been studying people all this time. I mean, how important is money in not only making us feel happy, but to acknowledge the, the word good that we've used, permit people to do good for that matter? Well, actually, when the UN does its World Happiness Report every year, they ask people, what are the essential ingredients of a good life for you? Mm -hmm. And uniformly all over the world, opportunities to be generous turns up as one of the pillars of feeling like you have a good life. And that means generous with money. It means mm -hmm. generous with time and energy. Um, but but to go back to that question you asked, Robert, what the, mm -hmm. the, that the, the listener asked, um, I think we each need to tune in to how interacting with social media makes us feel. And because we can tell when, when an interaction saps our energy, when it makes us feel more closed off, more wary of the world and of each other. And there are some interactions that make us feel more open. And I think each of us can both do that test and then turn away from those influences that close us down. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Zen teacher, once said that, that we create our minds by what we put into our minds. And, and now more than ever, we need to be proactive in, in determining what we allow in. Uh, Rabbi Wolpe, thoughts about this, or about oh, I, money I, also? Yeah, I actually, I turned for the wisdom on this to my daughter, who's 27. And she's getting her PhD in autism. And I said to her, I asked her, 
what makes, you know, I said, what makes you and the people that you work with and study have? And she talked about productive rest and unproductive rest. She said, a lot of us take unproductive rest. We scroll through Instagram for an hour. And at the end of it, we feel worse. Exactly what Bob Waldinger said. She said, but then productive rest is the kinds of things that we've all been talking about where you interact with other people. And even sometimes when your interactions are difficult, they are still more fulfilling. You think about them afterwards, they mean something, they contribute to your life, to the richness of the texture of your life, to your thoughts about it. That's why it's not always just about being happy, it's about living a rich and textured and, mm -hmm. uh, and full life. You mentioned autism, uh, which is something that I, I, I wanted to ask uh, first David Brooks, but also to hear from, from the psychiatrist on the panel about. Uh, one could look at all of the uh, all of the, uh, uh, the, the tips you give David for how to really speak to someone and how to get to know another person, and if you get all of those wrong, somebody who would be incapable of getting all of those things wrong and not not be clued into uh, uh, social signals from the other person, we might say that person's on the spectrum. We might do them. Um, is 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 this a realm of therapy? That is, um, uh, is it? Uh, can somebody be uh, educated to relate to people differently uh, than than they do naturally? Yeah, I'm so far over my head on this subject, but I will say there's a scientist named uh, Simon Baron Cohn in yes. Britain who studies uh, these things, and I uh, my impression is he does think. I mean, he's in therapy with his patients in order, and I I assume he's in it on, under the belief that you can help people improve. And I certainly know people in my own personal life who will tell you that they are on the spectrum, whatever that means, yeah. uh, and that they have studied how other, they are now able to read the signals they were formerly unable to read. Uh, and one thing I learned just in reading about this subject, which again, I'm far from being an expert, is that there was a beautiful blog post by a person who suffers from autism, who you think it's because somehow they're not emotional it's not they're not relating but the way this person described it is it's too hot there's too much intensity and then he says and you expect me to make eye contact and so it, it, it that was counterintuitive for me who really knew nothing about the subject uh, dr waldinger well i'd also like to say that we can both help people learn more of the social rules some people as we know autism is quite a range some people really can't learn, but many people can. But the other thing that's changed is how we frame neurodiversity for each other. So it's no longer that this person is just awkward or they can't, they haven't learned the rules. It's that they really are different and that that can help us treat those people with much more kindness and compassion and interest rather than aversion. And that goes a long way toward undoing the kind of lives of social failure that people were consigned to forever mm -hmm. before we really understood more about this condition. And I, even though I, I have no, I have no training. Okay. I just want to say that, but, but I have a daughter and, and she told me the following, because this is now her life. She said that the, in, in the brain, there's a salience network and the, in the salience network in normal people that is neuro, neurotypical people is directed outward. When someone walks in the room, you immediately notice them. For a lot of people who are autistic, the salience, directed, salience network is directed inward. So they their own feeling is just like David Brooks described. It's so intense that the outward stimulus is almost, they can't direct towards them. So, um, but also she taught me how much, it's not just that we can enable people who are neurodiverse to, to be more accepted, but also how much we can learn from people who mm -hmm. are neurodiverse. And I'm just going to close with this just so I can tell my daughter I quoted her a lot. When she was <laughs> in high school and started to work with autistic kids, I asked her, why do you like to do this? And remember, she was a, in a high school girl. So she said, well, they're never me. She said, they're always, even if they hurt you, they, it's, they don't intend to. They're not like malicious. They don't calculate bad things. And I said to her, what do you think they're missing? And she said to me, oh, dad, I don't think they're missing anything. And that's when I knew, like, I had a lot to learn. <laughs> well, here is uh, here is another uh, question from uh, 
a viewer, Gabrielle Saran, asks, can you share some tips on dealing with arrogant people who knowingly or unknowingly, the arrogant part perhaps, uh, encro encroach on your happiness? Thank you. Would anybody like to address dealing with arrogance in other people? I'll leave it to the two guys at Harvard to talk about it. At Harvard, I, I knew yeah, that I, that was coming. I knew that was coming. Well, can I, I, I actually, <laughs> I'll talk about me. My last sermon to my congregation was about, was asking them for their forgiveness for the times I didn't see them because I know me and I can walk right by someone and I'll be thinking about something and I won't look at them. And, and one of the things I would say to is sometimes that arrogant person doesn't know that they're being arrogant because I've been that person. And I know sometimes when someone said to me, you did this or you did that, I then felt awful because I just didn't know. And sometimes being better requires self-knowledge and requires somebody to gently point out when you said this, it made me feel that, um, or at least I felt that it didn't make me, but I felt that. And, and sometimes we just need to be told because doesn't matter where you are in the world, believe me, you can mess it up. Bob, any thoughts on that? Well, there, there's no arrogance at Harvard, David, so I don't know why you <laughs> think um, But, you know, but I do think also that many of the arrogant people who I know and work with are deeply <laughs> wounded. That doesn't mean we excuse them for their arrogance, but it means that it can help me not, not lead with belligerence as quickly. Uh, because many of them are suffering from wounds that make them need to show how superior they are. But I agree with uh, Rabbi David, who says, you know, sometimes people need to be shown. This, this is how it affects me when you talk this way, or this is what it's like, because I don't feel seen when we're in this conversation together to what David Brooks is writing about. And, and to not feel seen is one of the, the most painful experiences we can have with another person. And so to name it with an arrogant person is at least to try to move the conversation to a different plane. I, I feel obliged to return to technology with the three of you because I, I, I feel, and our, our last panel was about uh, our uh, relations with technology and uh, Professor Sherry Turkle of MIT has spent a lifetime <laughs> Uh, studying the relationship between people and computers. Uh, the first time I met her, she was studying relations between people and uh, robotic dogs that Sony was marketing. And uh, people became very attached to their robotic dogs, which was a, uh, I mean, people are attached to live dogs, but uh, they also then extended this to, uh, uh, to, to machines. Clearly, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, which... Uh, may not be as great a shock as it seems to be right now, or as great a shock to people who are young right now. It is uh, creating a, a an artificial version of personality of, of, of an individual. And if it's, if it's mostly text now, I'm sure it'll be any day now, very, very convincing images of people who are communicating with you and who are, fab, who are uh, imaginary creations. Uh, should we expect a world in which a great deal of our interactions are in fact with uh, digital creations that, that we have made, that, that uh, uh, we can't ever get to see them uh, very deeply, but they might uh, provide entertaining or uh, instructive conversations with us? Is it going to change our whole notion of what it means to to relate to other people when we will be relating sometimes, or our children at least, may be relating to people who aren't real. Uh, to Rabbi Walby, uh, you, you were, uh, oh, you want to start with me? Boy, yeah. there's so much. I, I'll I'll make a very brief, and then I'll leave it to. Uh, I I would say two quick things. One is the definition of real is going to change. Yeah. If something has such tremendous uh, ability to respond that it can make me feel that it's a person in almost every way. I don't know what real and not real will mean. And second, I see, as I think everybody does <clears throat> who looks at AI, 
tremendous, unfathomable potential for good and unfathomable potential for harm. So a lot of this will rest on the wisdom with which we create and limit um, such things if we have such wisdom. But yeah, I'm worried. Well, m- might it, Bob Walter, might it um, be an antidote to loneliness? Uh, it's not It's not a real person, but it's it's something that uh, answers back and uh, poses, uh, you know, oh. questions back to you. Well, it can be, and you probably know the film Her. There's also mm-hmm. a German film, I'm Your Man, about a bot who learns more and more to be the ideal partner to a woman. What does it mean if artificial intelligence can train itself to meet our every need? What then? Where where are we with each other as humans? And I think that the question is, do we somehow need the the unpredictability, the imperfection, the jarring qualities of human interaction to keep these brains and these psyches vibrant? I believe we do, rather than having the more and more perfectly attuned AI uh, simply meet our every need. It's a dystopian vision of, of what might happen. David? Yeah, I, I've spent a lot of time at OpenAI and at Google and Meta and all the places that are working on this. And they all talk about achieving what they call artificial general intelligence, which is human-like intelligence. And so after I go to these places, I'll call up a neuroscientist friend and say, you know, do you think they're going to create machines that can think that think like people do? And one of them, my friends said, well, that would be a nice trick because we don't know how people think. Uh, <laughs> we should not underestimate the human mind. <laughs> and so AI now and maybe for a long time does not possess understanding. It doesn't have a motivational structure. It doesn't have a model of the world. Uh, it doesn't have emotions, obviously. It doesn't have a body where a lot of our thinking happens. Uh, and so in my view, it's good at synthesizing the data set you give it. Uh, And so in that way, it's good at mimicking human behavior, but I'm dubious that uh, we'll be fully satisfied with our replicants, that that there'll be an AI bot that we find emotionally satisfying. And so I I think the, what AI will do is it will remind us what human are, humans are by revealing what it can't do. Hmm. And that, that, there will be certain human traits that will become even more valuable, like dis- possessing a distinct voice, possessing un- unusual opinions, uh, p- possessing the skills of emotional intimacy that I think will become more valued. And so that that's my optimistic take based on the idea that AI is probably a little more limited than we think it is right now. Okay. Uh, here's a, a good question for us to, uh, to end up on. It's from uh, a person named Anonymous Attendee. Uh, are there any concise words of advice all of you have for all of us as we walk away from this wonderful conversation and face a rather challenging world? Uh, well, let's let's start in the order we began. David Brooks, do you have any particular words of wisdom for uh, this? No. Is your your Mel like Brooks I, moment? I should yeah. stand on one leg and say something profound. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I words of advice. I mean. The one thing I'll say that's left out in the conversation and it was asked in the beginning is, can we change? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm a gigantic believer that we can change. I think I was pretty emotionally aloof uh, for much of my life, much of the life that Robert, you and I knew each other. Mm -hmm. I went through some very hard times about 11 years ago and David Wolpe was a fantastic friend to me at that moment. And I think I'm a more emotionally vulnerable and open person. Mm -hmm. I was at a, a festival in Nantucket, a conference, and they handed out pieces of paper on which were written lyrics to a love song. And they said, pick a stranger, stare at them in the eyes and sing the love song into their eyes. <laughs> if you had told me to do that 15 years ago, I would have spontaneously <laughs> combusted. But but I did it and I think, I think I've become softer and more emotional. And I think one of the, the great findings of the grant study is that people change and it's never too late to change. And so that's that's the hopeful thing I would end on. Here, here, uh, Bob Waldinger. Uh, Yes, from our study, my advice would be turn toward the people who energize you and uplift you. Invest in that, and that will take you a very long way toward becoming a better person. And uh, Rabbi David Wolpe. Uh, I, I would say what has been demonstrated in this conversation. That is, never say someone is just something 
human beings, every one of them, including the person who's wondering about themselves, is infinitely more complex and nuanced and capable and full of range and dreams and possibilities. And I'll, I'll just end this way, which I, I hope is a kind of summary. The story of Joseph in the Bible, Joseph has these dreams and his brothers hate him because he thinks they're gonna bow down to him and they throw him in Egypt and he goes into slavery. And there he starts to interpret the baker's dream and the cupbearer's dream and Pharaoh's dream and he comes second to Egypt. So Joseph falls by dreams and ri rises by dreams. What's the difference? The difference is that he falls when he can only hear his own dreams, but he rises as we all do when you can hear the dreams of others. Well, thank you, uh, Rabbi David Wolpe and uh, Dr. Bob Waldinger and David Brooks. Uh, thanks to all three of you for taking part in a, in a very interesting and I think actually uplifting uh, hour. Uh, many thanks to Joshua Plout, Ronnie Givigliano, uh, and Ryan Sutton from American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, which produces Global Connections. And also thanks to our technical director, Bobby Grandone. Uh, our program sponsor is the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a 501c3 national charitable organization uh, that represents in the United States Israel's largest hospital, Rabin Medical Center, in Petah Tikva, in Greater Tel Aviv. Uh, the group's website is www.afrmc.org. I'm Robert Siegel, and this has been Global Connections Navigating the New Normal. Uh, see you next month. Stay healthy and stay safe.